expecting something different, right? It's just me. It's just me. Welcome to Easter Sunday. Come on, aren't you glad to be at church today? Man, I'm glad you're here. You guys look incredible. All of our online guests, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Easter Sunday, man, what a beautiful weekend to celebrate the resurrection. I love, I mean, I love sharing the word, but there's a few times a year that are just special, and this is one of them, right? You just love talking about the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to do that a lot today. Uh, Maybe you've seen online this past week, uh, we've been announcing that we're going to have some special news uh, for our church family. And so I'm going to share with you some good news, and then we'll get to the even better news uh, in the resurrection. Are you ready for that? All right. So as of Friday afternoon, uh, we as a church have signed and purchased 30 acres of property in the heart of Columbiana, Alabama for our Columbiana campus. Come on, somebody. So we're going to be building a campus. Man, we planted that campus in 2018, and uh, many of you know this, but some of you don't. There's hundreds of people worshiping Jesus at our Columbiana campus today, uh, and sharing that news with them is something incredible. We've been looking for a long time, and uh, we're just so, we're so happy that we're going to be able to build what I know is a legacy space. What does that mean? It's, it's a facility that we're going to place that's going to outlive us all, right? Uh, and, the, and the gospel is going to be presented uh, for generations over in Columbiana. So thank Thank you, thank you, church, for your generosity, y'all. It makes a huge difference, and uh, I can't wait to get that project started, all right? Hey, everybody, pull out your notes, and let's dive in today. Uh, Easter Sunday, the greatest story ever. There's never been a better story told than the Easter message. It says it this way in Hebrews chapter 12, right at the top of your notes. It says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And I love this. I underline this in my notes. Because of the joy awaiting him, the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. The greatest story ever told. You know, there was a movie titled that back in 1965. There's been a number of movies throughout uh, history uh, that have portrayed the gospel in some way, form, or fashion. This one was a huge one. 1965 was really one of the first ones ever created that was like a blockbuster film talking about the gospel. Y'all know John Wayne was in the movie. I was like, John Wayne? I was like, where's his pistol? You know, like, I didn't even know he did anything other than Westerns, but there were some massive stars, and it made a huge splash in the movie industry. And, and the truth is, there's never been a film like that created that didn't. Anybody remember The Passion, uh, the Passion uh, movie? Incredible. And now, modern day, everybody sees the television show The Chosen, portraying the gospel and, uh, and, 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 and talking about the story of Jesus. Why is that? Why does something like that change so many people? Because, y'all, it's not like, like there's some weird twist in it. I mean, we know what's going to happen, right? Like there's not, a, there's not a twist in the show or in the movie. I saw a video the other day. There was a small group of men, and they were doing a Bible study, and, uh, and they were talking about the gospel, and they were like, okay, and we're about to get into the story, the part where Jesus dies. And this guy over here, he's like, wait a minute, he dies? Like they just like didn't know. And, uh, we know the story. We know what happens. Easter, everybody shows up today, and we know we're going to talk about what Jesus did. Why is it so impactful? Because if you believe it's true, it is paradigm shifting. And the truth is, whether you believe in Jesus, whether you follow Jesus as Savior or not, all of us have to acknowledge that Jesus changed the world. Like he, the world was turned upside down because of Jesus. Our calendar operates B.C., right? Like B.C., A.D., before Christ, the A.D., the, the Latin word that means the year of our Lord. Like we know everything shifted, everything changed because of Jesus. So the Christian faith says this, that Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary. 
He lived a perfect, sinless life with the sole purpose of sacrificing himself on a cross, bearing your sins and mine for the enti- of the entire world, all of our sins on the cross. And then three days later, he came back to life, conquering death, hell, and the grave so that you and I could be restored back to the Father through Jesus. That's the Christian faith. All other world religions look at Jesus and say, He was a good man. He was a great prophet. He was a great teacher. Jesus is mentioned in most world religion holy scriptures. Did you know that? Jesus is written into most of their, uh, their, their holy books as a prophet, as a great teacher. There's a problem with that, though. Because if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, he's not a great man. He's not a great prophet. If Jesus isn't who he said he was, he's the biggest con man that ever lived. He doesn't deserve to be on a list of prophets and good men. If he's not who he said he was, he deserves to be in the list of the greatest con men that ever lived. Anybody, anybody remember Charles Ponzi? Charles Ponzi, you may, know, you may know the term Ponzi scheme. He was the one that they named it all after. How about Bernie Madoff? Anybody ever heard of Bernie Madoff? This guy swindled $65 billion in what was known as, to this day, still the largest Ponzi scheme ever created. Anybody remember fake uh, Frank Abagnale? Frank Abagnale. You may remember the movie, Catch Me If You Can. This guy, this guy effectively for years convinced people that he was who he wanted to be. He was the greatest like impersonator ever. There were, he, was a, he impersonated to be a pilot, a plane pilot, uh, flew actual commercial planes. He was a, a surgeon. He, he literally uh, got people to believe that he was a doctor and a surgeon in a hospital. Millions of dollars he made impersonating different people over the course of his life. All of these people were well-respected, highly thought-of people until somebody found them out. Until, Until they found out they stole billions of dollars from them. Now they're on a list of some of the most disgraced people in all of history. And so how could Jesus be thought of as a good man? As a prophet, as this great, um, great man full of integrity and character, if he wasn't God, if he wasn't who he said he was. C.S. Lewis said it this way. C.S. Lewis said, Jesus was either Lord or lunatic. No way he could be. No way he could be a good man. No way he could be a righteous person because of some of the things that he said about himself. And so here's what I want to do today. I want to ask three questions. We're going to ask three questions as it relates to our faith, as it relates to Jesus. And we're going to survey our own personal faith today on Easter Sunday. You ready for that? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it's alive and breathing. Thank you that today, as we celebrate the resurrection, we're going to open your word. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you speak to all of us right where we are in our place in life. That we don't leave here the same but inspired to live our life on purpose in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. Number one, question you need to ask. Are you ready? Do I believe him? Do I believe him? Do I believe Jesus is who he clearly said that he was? That was a question that was asked over and over again in the Gospels. Often it was was asked by his disciples. If you read the Gospel of Mark, the whole Gospel of Mark is uh, is really a narrative that, that... clearly communicates that the disciples themselves didn't fully believe he was who he was saying he was. You get to the end of the gospel where Jesus has been uh, crucified and he's resurrected and still some of the disciples are struggling to believe. You can see it in John chapter 20 right there in your notes. It's talking about Thomas. The disciples have seen Jesus. They've witnessed him. They've touched him. And they've told Thomas, this is him. And listen to what he said. I won't believe it unless, unless unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. He said, peace be with you. He said to Thomas, put your fingers here in my hands. Look at them. Put your hand into the wound into my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, 
Thomas, you believe because you've seen me. But blessed are those who believe, having never seen. You see, the story of Jesus is pretty audacious. He made some massive claims. This isn't something that we should just walk into half-heartedly and go, okay, well, we're just going to celebrate the Easter story. No, no, no. I need to really decide if I fully believe he was who he said he was. Because Jesus said some things pretty crazy. He said this in Mark chapter 2. He said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am. Jesus said in John chapter 58, he called himself, I am. Now, I know in Western culture, we are waiting on him to say what he is, right? I am what? What are you, Jesus? What are you, what are you talking about? But it's no doubt in anybody's mind in Jewish culture, when Jesus said that in John chapter uh, 8, when he made that phrase, immediately everyone in Jewish culture would have immediately been transfer, transported back to where, where God told Moses, I am. They knew that they knew that he was calling himself God in the flesh. He said this in John chapter 14, I am. I alone am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said this in John chapter 10. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. He claimed authority to forgive sins in Mark chapter 2 verse 5. He claimed to be perfect and sinless in John chapter 8 verse 46. Jesus said some crazy, audacious things. Things. It's why when we, when we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the Gospels, that they are so unbelievably offended at Jesus. Because how could a man claim he is God? They hated him. And so there's three points I want to point out as to the validity of what's going on, what we read in scriptures. Number one, you need to write this down. It's not in your notes. It's extra. It's an eyewitness account. This isn't some story that's written uh, like a fairy tale. It's not some fabricated crazy thing that was just written in that. The stylistic way that it was recorded in Scripture is that of an eyewitness account. It's Jesus saying, I'm not a symbol. I'm really here. I'm not just an impression in your mind. I'm not just kind of a spiritual presence. You're not just seeing things. I'm flesh and bones. Feel my hands. Give me something to eat. He shared meals with them. Give me some food. I'll eat it in front of you. You'll see I'm not a ghost. He goes right, like, I'm a human form. Like Jesus was showing them, like, who he was. And then when you read that in the gospel account, it's, it's kind of trivial. It's almost silly that he would even record that. Give me some food and I'll eat it. Touch my hands and you'll see. Why would, they, why would they record that? It's kind of even silly to say it. Why? Because it's an eyewitness account. It's written in the way, it's written from a person who physically experienced the situation. It wasn't fabricated and some of the outlandish things that they saw that they recorded were recorded because it was actually happening. Another one of the things that are so crazy that was recorded, number two, we see that number one, it was an eyewitness account, number two, Women were the first ones to declare he's alive. Now, I know we're in a complete different time and place in 2024 in the United States of America. But unfortunately, ladies, uh, back in that day, your, your, your eyewitness account would have been thrown out in court. Nobody trusted a woman. Not a soul. Like women, like uh, in that day, the, a woman's testimony wasn't even permissible in court. Women were unreliable, untrusted sources, yet Scripture records women declaring that Jesus is alive. Historians say that if the story were being made up, they would have never recorded women as the witnesses. Credibility hinged on credible sources. Wouldn't you agree with that? And so if I'm trying to make something up and I want to make sure that the masses in the moment are going to have any chance of believing what I am going to say, if I'm fabricating that, I want to make sure that it is the perfect story. Come on, anybody got kids? Y'all know, huh? Some of the stories your kids make up, you're like, there ain't no way that y'all could have fabricated, like, like that, that could have actually, you know what I'm saying? What am I saying? It was so unbelievable that it was believable. They wrote it. They recorded for all of history to see women seeing Jesus alive. Historians say that that's actually one of the greatest examples of the validity of Scripture and the transparency of it. Kind of cool. Another, number three, one of the last things. There's a lot of ways I can show you the validity, but one of the last things that I think is really, really interesting is that Jews 
were the last people on earth that would have ever conceded that a man could become a god. The last people. No Jew would have ever conceded that a man could become a god. Yet, along comes Jewish leaders confessing him as Lord. Along comes Jewish people kneeling their knee to the Savior. The gospel was unbelievably offensive to the Jews. But then you have disciples willing to lay down their lives and go to horrific deaths on their claim of eyewitness accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. James, his brother, y'all, how, how much, how, what do you think would ever have had to happen for your sibling to declare you God? <laughs> think about that. Huh? I mean, come on, somebody. James, it took James a long time. James didn't even believe it most of his life. It took the resurrection. It took him seeing him rise from the dead to go, okay, I believe it. <laughs> right? James declared him. My Lord and Savior, you can read through the book of James and see. Paul himself prided himself in fighting against and murdering Christians. Why? Because he thought it was a lie. He thought it was false. They were leading people astray until he met Jesus personally. He had a personal encounter with the Lord himself and immediately shifted his entire life. And Jesus didn't say, Paul, uh, let, I'm glad you made that decision. Let's move on into prosperity. Jesus said, Paul, let me show you how you must suffer for me. And y'all know what Paul did? He did it. The disciples, all of them, all of them died horrific deaths based on their eyewitness account of Jesus coming back to life. And so the question is this, do I believe that? Do I believe him? Lots of, lots of super strong, interesting evidence that leads to the validity of the resurrection of Jesus. None of which, 500 people witnessed him alone after he had come back to life. And so I have to answer that question, and the next thing I have to answer is if I believe that he's alive, if I believe that he came back from the dead, the next question that I have to answer is do I trust him? Do I trust him? Because you can believe a lot of things and still not fully trust it. You know what I mean? Like you can know something is real, know something is tangible, know something is touchable, but that doesn't mean that it has proven its trustworthiness to you. And so we see that happen in Matthew chapter 28. It's a little confusing. I'm not going to lie with you. This is one of the most confusing passages of Scripture to me in the Bible. It says, then the 11, it's the very end, after Jesus had already physically shown himself to the disciples multiple times. They've shared meals together after the resurrection. This is Matthew chapter 28, right before he gives the Great Commission and ascends into heaven. He tells the 11 disciples, uh, they left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him, get this, they worshipped him. Now, here's the confusing part. But some of them doubted. What? Y'all just witnessed the man rise from the dead. You just shared meals with him with holes in his hand. He has appeared to you no less than seven or eight times already over the course of 40 days. He told you to go there. He met you there, and you worshipped him. Yet some of you doubted. Isn't that crazy to you? That's weird to me. Why would they have doubted? It's, the way, like it's one thing to believe something is real. It's a whole other thing to fully trust that thing. And there were some trust issues amongst the disciples. It's kind of like take these chairs, for example. Uh, that everyone is sitting in when you got here today. I witnessed uh, all of you coming in and sitting in these chairs, and, um, and I didn't see very many people that were like having to run many experiments on the trustworthiness of the chair that you were about to sit in. Like you, you knew. You sat in it, felt good, comfortable. Has anybody ever sat in a chair that proved you wrong? Mm. Oh, that's embarrassing, isn't it? I've done it. As un unfortunately, in my life, all of the chairs that have proved me wrong have been in the most public settings possible. <laughs> like, it's never a chair hidden in private, right? It's always. A hundred people's going to see it. I've sat in this plastic. Uh, we go on mission trips a lot, and uh, in a particular orphanage that we sit in, that, like, they have these. Some of you are seeing. You've been with me. Uh, they have these plastic chairs, and y'all, uh, hundreds of kids sitting around. Here I go, plop down into that chair, and shattered everywhere. Let me tell you what you never, let me tell you what you never lived down. Breaking a chair. <laughs> Never. 
I got kids. Kids, kids can't remember what they had for dinner 30 minutes ago, but they remember 12 years ago when I, when I broke a chair. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. Some of you, some of you have trust issues. You're struggling trusting Jesus because somebody has let you down. Somebody else has, has, has they weren't trustworthy. I ain't going to lie. I don't sit in a plastic chair that I don't test fully because that one chair let me down. And can I tell you that one chair that let me down, I've, I've sat in thousands more that were fully trustworthy. But I can't sit in a chair without wondering, is it going to hold me up? <laughs> is it going to work? And can I tell you that there's so many people in this world, I believe that there were disciples on the hill that day that had witnessed him, experienced him, still lacking trust in him because they had been wounded by somebody. They had been let down. They were still worrisome. We have just walked around for three years with this guy thinking he was the Messiah and he died on a cross. He's going to be with the Lord. Is he ever coming back? Am I ever going to see him again? Did I just waste the last three years? How many people in your life have you placed the weight of Jesus on their shoulders and they've let you down and because somebody let you down, you don't feel like you can trust Jesus? You don't trust the Lord because the church hurts you. You don't trust, you don't trust Jesus because some Christian has looked different. Gandhi said it this way. He said, I love y'all's Christ. I don't like you Christians. Y'all don't look like him. Can I I implore you today, don't live the rest of your life missing out on the grace of God because you trusted in the wrong chair, because you trusted in the wrong thing. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except me, except through me. Some of you tried to get to Jesus through your spouse. Some of you have tried to, tried to get to faith through your friends, and they've let you down, so you've lost trust in Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's the worst decision you could ever make. He's trustworthy. He's foolproof. You can't miss him. He'll never let you down. He's never once failed anybody. The name of Jesus, it says at the end of days, is the name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Do I trust him? Do I trust him? The last thing I'll share with you is this is... Even more important, if I believe him and I think I can trust him, do I know him? Do I know him? Do I have a relationship with him? Jesus says something really profound and really, really eye-opening in Matthew chapter 7. He said, no one who calls out to me, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen to what he says. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. See, on Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. We, we talked the talk. We acted as if, come on, we could even take that a little further. We went to church consistently in your name. I, I, wore, I had the bumper stickers. I wore the shirt. My Instagram said, I love Jesus. But Jesus will say, I replied, I never knew you. But we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other. I had somebody ask me, how do I know if I know Jesus? I said, well, have you ever had a friend that you didn't know you were friends? No. You never had a friend in your life that you didn't know if you were actually friends. You know what I mean? Like if you were actually friends, you didn't. There was no question. A couple of weeks ago, I was on... uh, I was on a work trip, my wife and I, and we were flying home from South Florida, and I was getting on the plane, and in first class, as I walked by, I had to take a double take. There he was, John Smokes, sitting in first class. Some of you, if you're a Braves fan, you know John Smokes. I mean, one of the greatest pitchers that ever played the game. I was like, oh my God, it's John Smokes. And I'm like, I'm tempted to make a fool of myself, right? Because I think I know the guy. I think we're buds. I mean, we won a World Series together. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like we did this, you know? I mean, I helped him. We helped, I mean, we did this thing together. He's, his picture is on my wall. I've got every baseball card of the guy. I know that he's fixing to go pro in, in professional golf. I wanted to sit down and be like, hey, man, how's it going? What clubs are you using? You doing any well? You find a new ball that worked? How's life? Don't you know that guy would have been like, hey, bro, I don't, I don't know you. 
get up out of my bubble. This is why I can't fly commercial, (laughs) because of crazy people like you. How many people have you seen in your life that you just felt like you know? You just felt like maybe because you knew about them. I know a lot about the guy. Probably tell you what shoe size he wears. One of the greatest pitchers ever. He don't know me. It would be an awkward conversation for me to sit down and say, let's, let's, let's share a meal together. And I say that's probably true with many of us in Jesus. Do we know him? Can I tell you something? Easter didn't happen so that we could know about Jesus. It happened so that you could know Jesus. I want to pray with you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? And our band's going to come. They're going to play some music. Maybe you're here today and you have to answer that question. Do I believe him? Okay, yeah, I believe him. Lots of, lots of proof. He either was or he wasn't. I believe he was. Do I trust him? Man, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I'm going to be honest with you, Brandon. I've been hurt a whole lot of times. I've been wounded by people. Can I tell you, people aren't Jesus. There's not a wound that a human's ever caused that Jesus can't heal. There's not a hurt that you've ever walked through that he can't heal. So if I'm ready to trust him, am I ready to know him? Am I ready to know him? Today you can walk out of here knowing that you're beginning a brand new relationship with Jesus. What better day? What better time? What better moment? You would simply say this, Father, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I believe that you came, lived a sinless life. The evidence proves itself that you died on a cross and came back to life to reconcile me back to the Father. And so today I trust you. I give my life to you. I accept you as my Savior. And from this day following, I'm gonna follow you as my Lord. I want to know you. I don't want to just know about you. I don't want to get to heaven one day and act like I've met some celebrity. I want to get to heaven one day and fall into the arms of my friend. So forgive me. I'm believing with everything that's in me. Help my unbelief. And Father, I pray for my family today. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that we know one another. We're here today celebrating, worshiping the resurrected King. Oh, that we would walk out of this place ready to live our life on purpose as resurrection people. Let it make a difference in our spheres of influence. May you get all the honor and all the glory out of our lives. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Come on, church. Can you celebrate Jesus today? Come on, he's worthy. Hey, listen, if you made a decision to say yes to Jesus today on the Connect card we spoke about earlier, there's a place where you can check I'm committing my life to Christ. And we'd encourage you to do that for several different reasons. The first being we want to be able to celebrate that with you. We want to pray for you. But we also want to send you some information on some next steps because this is the greatest decision that you're ever going to make. And we want to be here for you. We're not going to just throw a Bible in your hands and say, awesome, see you in heaven one day. But we want to be here for you every single step of the way because the truth is there's going to come a time when you have questions or you have needs or maybe you just have a day where you just feel like I am struggling and I just can't keep going. But we believe so wholeheartedly that when we lock arms and we walk this thing out together, there's nothing God can't do through us. And I firmly believe that if we all get together and we all do this together, man, God can change not just our community, our state, our nation, but the entire world and we're willing to walk this thing out together. So listen, if that was you today, please mark that down on the Connect card before you go. We're gonna transition now to a moment of giving. And listen, if you're our guest today, we don't anticipate you giving anything today. In fact, we'd say don't give anything today. That's for those of us who call Cultivate Church home. But if you are new to giving around here, there's several easy ways up on the screen for you to be able to do that. And we just want to say thank you so much for being such a generous church and being obedient to what the Bible teaches us about our resources. You know, there's a great story in the Bible where Jesus is preaching to, it says 5,000 people, and those are the men, but it's probably closer to 20,000 people there. And 
It's getting later on in the day and the, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we got to go. Like all the restaurants are closed in this town. There's no food for anybody. Everyone's got to get home and eat. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You guys are going to be responsible for feeding all of these people. So of course the disciples look and they're like, how in the world are we supposed to do that? And I have to imagine they kind of come back to Jesus, maybe with a little bit of shame, say, all we got are five loaves of bread and two fish. And you see, Jesus doesn't do what we would probably do in that situation. How could you not be prepared? Like, you know, I told you guys to feed and you show up with five loaves of bread and two fish and that's it. But instead Jesus takes it, he blesses it, and then he multiplies it. That way everyone had more than enough food and there was even some left over. And the amazing thing about that, when it comes to our resources, but it also comes to our time and our effort, our energy, our focus, really just with our entire lives, that when we give it to Jesus, He's able to bless it and he's able to multiply it. Whatever that looks like, whether it is our finances, whether it's our time, whatever it looks like, our family, our careers, when we get to give it to Jesus, he's able to bless it and then multiply it. But he's never able to bless and multiply, but we never give him in the first place. And man, being able to watch and see what the Lord has done when we come together and do this collectively as a group, as a part of our worship, every single Sunday and the needs that it has met, the impact it's made for people, not just in Shelby County, but the impact it's made for people all over the world, it's unbelievable and it's amazing that we get to be a part of that. There are people who would not have homes, they would not have food, water, clothes, education, but most importantly, they would never know who Jesus is if it were not for the generosity of Cultivate Church. And it's an honor we get to do that together. And listen, we just wanna say thank you so much for being such a generous church. We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We get to see the needs and we're able to meet the needs and that's what it's all about. Listen, if you'll stand with me as we dismiss today, we're gonna to pray over our giving. And don't forget your connect cards if you're new here. Man, meet us out there on your way out. God, we love you. And we're just so thankful for what you're doing, God. We pray over our giving today. Pray that we will steward it well, being used to meet the needs of people all over the world. And God, I just want to pray that this week we have opportunities to be the light in the middle of the darkness.